Okay, so good morning everyone um, and welcome to Thursday's lecture. So um, in this lecture we're going to be sort of also talking about hash tables but not about implementing hash tables uh, which we went through on Tuesday but more using them, right? So this is a relatively new subtopic that I added because in the real world usually you're not going to be implementing hash tables, right? Usually the language that you're using will already have a library or a, a container provided by the standard library um, that provides hash tables. Right? So um, in this lecture, we'll be talking about how we can actually solve some problems using hash tables. Okay, so um, let's first uh, recap hash tables. So what are they? So a hash table is a data structure, remember, that stores key value pairs, right? So it's a data structure that is used to implement an associative array, right? Which is the kind of ADT um, that we can implement in different ways, like we saw using an unordered array, an ordered array, a uh, binary search tree, right? But a hash table is a way to implement an associative array that is very efficient, right? So Hash table stores key value pairs, and remember that the keys are unique. Okay, so we have the three main operations here, which are insert. So we want to insert a key value pair, right? If you're trying to insert a key value pair and the key already exists in the hash table, then it just replaces the value. Uh, the second operation is lookup. So given a key, we want to retrieve its associated value. Right. And finally, if you have insert, then of course you might want to have delete. So given a key, delete, it's a key value pair. Okay, and we looked at the performance of a hash table uh, in the previous lecture as well. Right, And we saw that um, in the case of hash tables, it's the average case that's more relevant to us, right? Because assuming that the hash table is implemented well, which it would be if we're using a hash table library implemented by you know, the people developing the programming language, um, then you know, the average case performance of the hash table will be 01, right? And so in the worst case, the hash table is theoretically ON, um, but this doesn't happen in practice, right? So this would happen if we're inserting a bunch of keys and all the keys get hashed to the same index into the array, right? So that's the worst case, um, but you know, the hash functions that the hash tables use usually are really good so that they really evenly distribute the keys, right? no matter what kind of pattern of keys you can come up with. Okay, so yeah, average case 01, and, and this is why they're used so often, right? So hash tables are used pretty much everywhere. Um, due to not only their efficiency, but their need, but the need to store key value pairs, right, to solve problems, All right? So in, so they're provided by the standard library of many programming languages. For example, Python provides a, uh, provides a hash table data type, which is actually called a dictionary. Um, C++, you know, provides the map and unordered map data types or containers, and Java provides a hash map and so on. Okay, so one application of a hash table might be to implement a set, right? So remember, let's remind ourselves what is a set. You know, you, you all implemented it for assignment one. So a set is an unordered collection of distinct elements, right? And the main operations for a set were insert, so insert something into a set, uh, check if an item is in the set, and also we might want to remove the item, remove an item from the set. Okay, so three main operations, and of course you can have you know union, intersection, equals, a subset, and so on, um, but we'll just focus on these. Okay, so how might we implement a set? So here is the interface. So uh, what kind of data structures might we use to implement this set? Uh, well, you know, we have a bunch of different choices, right? We could choose an unordered array. 
where an unordered array is ON because of the need to perform a linear search, right, in order to find any element. Right, so it's ON. Uh, with an ordered array, we can do slightly better for checking if an element exists, right, because if the array is ordered, then we can use binary search, which would make it log N, right? And unfortunately, um, even though the array is ordered, uh, insert and delete are still ON, right? And I asked this to people on Tuesday. Um, does anyone here remember why insert and delete are still ON? Because you have to just observe it in the same order? Yeah, yeah, so that's exactly it, right? Because in order to insert or delete something, um, you need to keep the array ordered, so that means you have to shift the items up or down, depending on whether you're inserting or deleting. Okay, so insert and delete are still ON, which is uh, pretty bad if you're inserting things regularly. Right, so, so another data structure we might want to use is an ordered linked list, but actually we don't really want to use it because it's ON, right? Um, because of the nature of a linked list, right? Every time you need to find an element, you have to start from the beginning of the list and follow the next pointers until you find the item that you're looking for. Okay, and before we covered graphs, we looked at a uh, we looked at binary search trees, right? Which sort of um, gets allows us to kind of take advantage of the benefits of ordered arrays and ordered linked lists, right? So with ordered arrays, uh, we can perform binary search to find an element in log n time, but inserting and deleting was still inefficient, right? That's because of the need to shift um, with a linked list, you don't actually need to perform shifting, right? Once you find where to insert or where to delete, you can just rearrange a couple of pointers and then insert the item or insert the node in O1 time, right? Once you've found where to insert, right? Now with binary search trees, um, we could take advantage of both of those things because first of all, binary search tree is a linked data structure, right? It uses pointers, so it doesn't require any shifting. And also the way that it worked, um, the way that you perform searches is similar to binary search, right? Compare the element that you're looking for with the current elements, and if it's less than, then you go left. If it's greater than, then you go right. Okay, and, um, and so binary search trees had this kind of advantage, but unfortunately, um, binary search trees, like the regular binary search trees aren't guaranteed to be balanced, right? Which is why we had to look at AVL trees, which are a type of binary search tree that remains height balanced, right, regardless of what order you insert the elements in. Okay, so an AVL tree uh, allowed us to have log n, uh, insert, uh, and delete, right, and also checking if an element exists. Okay, so if we implement a set with a hash table, then we can actually do better than an AVL tree on average, right? So um, how do we actually implement a set using a hash table? Um, so remember that a hash table stores key value pairs and keys are unique, right? And this kind of has the same characteristic, characteristic as the items in a set, right? The items in a set also have to be unique, right? So, so you know, we can kind of map the you know, insert, contains, and delete operations to operations in a hash table relatively easily. Right? Whenever we want to insert into the set, um, then what we do is we just insert the key into the hash table. Right? That's it. And, and you know, hash tables store key value pairs, but it doesn't really matter what value we use in this case, right? because all we care about is the key. Right? So when we want to insert, then we just insert into the hash table, insert the item into the hash table as a key. Um, if we want to check if the set contains um, an item, then we just check if the hash table contains the key, uh, um, contains the item as the key, right? And if we want to delete from the set, then we just delete that item from the hash table. Okay, so let's try and implement the set ADT uh, using a hash table. 
Now it's going to be it's going to be really simple, right? So what I have here is a hash table implementation. Um, so this one just uses separate chaining. Okay, so all implemented already. So now we can actually implement our sets using a hash table. Now in this directory, I also have a bunch of different implementations of a set. So I have a set implemented using an unordered array. All right. I also have a set implemented using a binary search tree. All right now, this is, you know, um, part of this is the assignment one solution. So I'm not going to scroll down too far. But you know. and finally, here is the hash table implementation, which we're going to do right now, and it's going to be really, really simple. Okay, so first of all, we're using a hash table right, in our set. Um, so in our set struct, what I'm going to do is just create a field that contains the hash table that we're going to be using. Right, so hash table, um, we'll just abbreviate as HT. Okay, and I think that is it. Right, so we're just using a hash table here. And when we create a new set, all we need to do is malloc the set struct first of all, and then create the hash table itself. So SHT equals hash table new. Okay, then we just return the set. Okay, so now when we want to free the set, right, all we need to do is do the opposite of what our set function, our set new function does, right? So all we have to do is to free the hash table. Um, so s hash table free sht, and then free s. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so now to insert an element into the set, um, so. So how, uh, so what was our idea for inserting? So once we're given the item, right, all we need to do is to insert the item into the hash table as a key, right? So, so what we'll do is we'll use the hash table insert function, right? And this function takes in a key value pair, right? And we want the elements that we want to insert into the set to be passed in as the key, right? So we'll pass in elm as the key. And the value doesn't really matter in this case, right? So we can actually choose anything for our value. Um, in this case, you know, our values are integers. So, you know, we can choose zero, we can choose alum, it doesn't matter. So I'll just choose zero. Okay, and you might be wondering, okay, so how does this function handle duplicates, right? So if we insert duplicates, you know, is the you know, set gonna stop working? Uh, well, no, right? Because can someone tell me why it would still work? Um, because the actual value doesn't matter that you're giving element as a key. So if you give LM again, yeah. uh, it's not going to change anything? Um, yeah, so remember a hash table stores you know, key value pairs where keys are unique, right? If you insert the key again, it will just replace the value, right? But it doesn't matter. But the value doesn't matter in this case, only the key. Okay, so we just call hash table insert. Um, for deleting from the set, we just call hash table delete. Right, and we pass in the element as the key. And to check if an element is in the set, uh, well, we just call hash table contains. Okay, so we just check if the element exists in the hash table as a key. So return hash table contains. Okay, and I guess we can also uh, return, uh, we can implement set size. So all of these functions are in the hash table um, interface here. Uh, so here we have insert, delete, contains, uh, gets, we know we're not using get in this case because you know it's a set, so we don't care about the value. Um, 
and there's a hash table size function. So all right, so let's call hash table size. Okay, and now um, there is also set show. So this function should print out all the items in the set. Um, and what this means is to actually want to print out all the keys in the hash table, right? So um, unfortunately, because this is C, there is like no easy way for us. Um, if the hash table is an ADT, there is no easy way for us to actually iterate through the elements of a set. Uh, sorry, iterate through the elements of a hash table, right? So this is harder to implement. So what you would actually need in order to implement this is like a cursor, basically, right, for a hash table. Uh, but I haven't implemented that. So uh, we'll just leave that as unimplemented. Okay, so now let's compile. Okay, so I have a program here for testing uh, whether the set works properly. Um, so this is just a really simple uh, test program. So what it does is it just adds all the multiples of three, then it adds all the multiples of five, removes all the multiples of 15, um, and then it'll just check whether the right elements are in the set or not. All right. So really basic. Um, so let's just run this program. Right, and it finishes without any errors, which means uh, since the program uses assert based tests, uh, it seems like our hash table works. Okay, so next up, let's compare the different implementations, right? So we have an implementation with an unordered array, we have an implementation using a binary search tree, and also an implementation using a hash table. And there's another program here, which is called benchmark set, uh, which performs um, a lot more insertion operations. Right, so uh, the program inserts pretty much all the numbers between one, uh, zero and 50,000. Right, so this program gets compiled with each of the different hash table, sorry, each of the different set implementations. So we're going to run this program. Um, so we're going to run the benchmark on each of them and see how long they take. All right, so we'll time them using the time command. So first of all, let's time the unordered array implementation. Right, so it's expected to take a while because all the operations are ON right, because of linear search. Right, so it takes about 10.4 seconds, right, user time. Okay, so that's pretty slow. Um, let's see how long the binary search tree implementation takes. All right, so 50,000 elements, remember? So how long is this gonna take? Um, so only 0.09 seconds. All right, and we can run it a few times just to make sure that it's consistent, All right? So Okay, 0.09 seconds around. All right, and then let's run the benchmark on the hash table implementation. So, um, so this should take, you know, should, this should be a little bit faster, right? Because a binary search tree has log n a time complexity, whereas a hash table has O1 time complexity on average. Um, so if we time it, we see that it is a little bit faster. Um, you know, point, you know, ranging between 0.06 to 0.08. Okay, uh, but now let's actually compare the binary search tree and the hash table um, specially. So we'll go back to our benchmark program and just replace this hash define um, so that now we are inserting a million elements instead of just 50,000. And hopefully we can see a much bigger difference now. Okay, so so obviously I'm not gonna run the benchmark set array, that will take way too long. Uh, but let's time 
benchmark set BST. All right, so takes about 1.19 seconds, I guess. Okay, so fairly consistent. And now let's time the hash table implementation. All right, so we can see that it is actually much faster now. Okay, so 0.64 seconds, you know, almost half the time that the binary search tree implementation took. Okay, so that's really nice. And it shows you that um, for comparing different time complexities, sometimes you do need a larger input size. Okay, so that is the set implementation. So what is the time complexity of the hash table implementation? It'll be 01 on average. Cool, so that's the sets implementation. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so let's move onwards to our next uh, data structure or data type. So the next one I wanna look at is called a counter. Right, so what is a counter? Uh, so a counter is a collection of items um, not necessarily distinct to this time, uh, but where each distinct item has a count, right? So basically we can insert whatever items we want. We can insert duplicates, uh, we can insert you know, distinct elements, but every time we insert something into the counter, uh, we're going to increase the counts for it, right? There's going to be counts for that item that increases as we insert more and more of that item. Okay, so the main operations for a counter are add, so basically we give the counter an item and that's going to increase the count of that item by one, right? And also get, which is given an item, what is its count? So how many of that item has been added to the counter so far? Right now, if an item is not in the counter, then that means its count will be zero, right? So that means get should return zero in this case. Um, so here are the main functions for the counter. Um, of course, you could add more functions like counter remove, right? You might want to remove an item from a counter, therefore decreasing its counts. Um, but um, let's focus on these two operations, right? Add and get. Okay, so once again, how do we implement a counter? So we might want to choose an ordered array, but if we do that, then of course there's the problem of shifting, which would make uh, inserting or deleting O n, right? But there is um, a log n time complexity for getting count of something. Right? If we use an AVO tree, then we get a time complexity of log n, and if we use a hash table, then we should be able to achieve O one on average, right? So let's try and see how we can implement a counter ADT, right? So if we use a hash table, um, does anyone have any ideas about how we might use it to implement the counter? Keeping in mind that you know, a hash table contains key value pairs. So any ideas about how we would implement adding something? Yeah. You could do item, uh, item and the value could be the, uh, the count pair. Yeah, perfect. So Mm -hmm. if it doesn't exist, then create the key value pair and yeah, that sounds good to me. So, right, so hash table stores key value pairs. So um, let's use, um, so let's let the item be the key and its count be the value, right? So um, initially, you know, initially the counter is gonna be empty, but whenever we insert an item, what we can do is first check if the item exists in the hash table, right? If it doesn't exist, then we're going to insert it with a count of one, right? If it already exists in the hash table, then we get whatever its count is, and then we just increment its counts, right? So we can reinsert uh, the item into the hash table with 
the count increased by one as the value. Okay, so, and of course, in order to get an item's count, we can just perform a lookup. Right? So we just perform a get in the hash table. Okay, so this just summarizes what I said. So we use a hash table to map items to their counts. So the item, in this case, is the key. The count is the value. And to add something, we look up the counts, the item's count in the hash table. Then we reinsert with the count increased by one. Okay, so let's try and implement this. Okay, so I've got my hash table implementation. So let's go into counter.c. Okay, now our counter just uses a hash table, right? So what we'll do is we'll just create a field inside the counter structs for the hash table. And in our counter new function, we will just create a new hash table. Hash table new return C. All right, in order to free the counter, we just free the hash table and then free the count struct. So hash table free, C, H, T, and then free C. Okay, so how do we implement add? So let's think about what we said earlier. Okay, so if the counter doesn't exist yet, I'm sorry, if the item doesn't exist in the hash table, um, then we want to insert the item into the hash table with a count of one, right? So how might we use the hash table functions to achieve that? Well, first of all, let's check if the item exists in the hash table. Right, so that would be hash table contains. Um, so C H T item. Right, so if the hash table contains the item as the key, or rather if it doesn't, right, then we're just going to insert the item into the hash table and pass in one as the value. Right, so item one okay and otherwise right so if the item is in the hash table that means we can retrieve its count right and then we can increment that count and insert it back into the hash table right so in count is going to be we're going to call the get function from the hash table so C H T item, and then we're going to reinsert the item into the hash table with the count increased by one. Okay, so that means before we inserted, we added to the counter. If the count of the item was three, for example, then we're going to insert the item with a count of four, and that's going to replace the count in the hash table. Okay. So that's how we implement add. And then counter get is relatively straightforward. So first of all, we first want to check you know, if the item does exist in the hash table. Right? And we need to do this because the get function, remember, assumes that the key exists in the hash table. Right, if we try to call the get function on a key that doesn't exist, we'll get an error. Um, so first let's check if the item exists in the hash table. Right, if it exists, then we will return, um, we'll call hash table get and return whatever it returns. Right, otherwise, will return zero because the item doesn't exist. Okay, so, so that's the implementation. Now let's have a look at the testing program. So it's pretty similar to the sets testing program. 
right? So what I'm doing here is I'm just adding all the multiples of three, then adding all the multiples of five. You know, it's kind of like fizz buzz. Um, and then, you know, we have a for loop just checking the count of each element. So if, an, if the number is divisible by both three and five, then its count should be two. You know, if it's divisible by only three or only five, then its count should be one, and otherwise the count should be zero. Okay, so I will make uh, and then run the test counter program. Right, and it runs without any errors. Okay, so that is how we implement a counter. Now there is one improvement that we can make to this, right? And it's to do with the problem that I kind of described at the end of the previous lecture, which is that if we're trying to retrieve the value of an item which we don't know exists, uh, then we have to call two hash table functions, right? First, we have to check if the key exists, and if the key exists, then we call the get function, right? The lookup function. Um, and I said that to get around that, hash tables can provide a function that takes in a key, and if the key doesn't exist, then it'll return a default value, right? Instead of, um, instead of, you know, the associated value because the value doesn't exist, right? So the function to do that was called hash table or default in this case. Right, so the function takes in a key, but also a default value. And if the key doesn't exist in the hash table, it'll return the default value that we've given it. Um, and that is useful because um, a hash table doesn't know right, what values are valid or not because a hash table is just used by someone right, or another program. Right, but if the user is allowed to provide a default value, then the user can interpret that properly. Right. If the, if the get function returns a minus one whenever you know, the key doesn't exist, then from the user's perspective, that could be ambiguous. Uh, yeah? Uh, how exactly is that different to what we did? Because wouldn't the, wouldn't the get function only check whether it returns a value or returns a default value? Um, so, uh, so the main difference is that it only requires us to perform one function call. Um, and therefore, the key only needs to be hashed once. Um, and looking through the hash table only needs to be performed once. Um, I can actually show the implementation over here. Um, so the function here hashes the key um, uh, to a particular index, and then it just looks through the linked list associated with, uh, contained at that index, right? And if it finds the key, then it returns the value. Otherwise, it just returns the default value. Okay, so let's improve our implementation. Um, so this will actually be much more elegant compared to this if-else solution. So let's call hash table gets or default. Right, and then pass in the item. And what should we pass in as the default value? Anyone have any ideas? Yeah? Yeah, zero. Cool. So, so zero, right? Because if the item doesn't exist in the hash table, then its count is zero. Right? So it makes sense for us to return zero. Okay. And then we just call hash table insert. And insert the item with the count increased by one. Okay. And that's it. Okay, so how does this work? So if the item doesn't exist in the hash table, then this function will return zero. That means when we insert it, it's going to insert the item with the count of one, right? Because zero plus one is one. So the behavior is exactly the same as this if statement over here. And if the item does exist, then this function will return the count, right? Because the item does exist in the hash table. Um, and then it'll insert the item with the count of one, uh, increased by one, right? So same behavior as this part of this code.
Okay, and for hash, uh, for counter gets, we can do the same thing. So we can return hash table gets or default C H T item zero. Okay, so so hopefully you see how this works, right? If the item isn't in the hash table, then this function will return zero. Makes sense. Uh, because that means the item isn't in the counter, right? And if it is, then it'll return the count instead. So let's compile the program and run the tests, right? And it still works. Okay, so there we go. There's the counter ADT. And um, the average cost of these functions, if we implement the counter using a hash table is 01. Okay, so any questions about the counter? Uh, if you wanted to implement a decrement, then I'm assuming you would do similar to A? Um, yeah, so be very similar. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. But the record, the, the value could be a, um, a pointer to an integer instead, uh, so that you could like straight away uh, access an increment, but then you'd need a cursor to be able to free, right? Um, I'm trying to conceptualize what you're saying. <laughs> like, uh, as, in, like in, as in the uh, each uh, value, so the each um, uh, key value pair would be. Yeah. The value would be a point to mal int. Yeah. So that you could. Um, no, I don't think hmm. that would work anyway. So I was thinking whether you could like uh, optimize the 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 increment of that. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, but then I think for free you'd need a cursor to be able to go through all the elements. Um. Yeah. 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 Interesting idea. Um. Okay. So. So we've covered the set ADT, we've covered the counter ADT. Now the counter ADT is also called a multi-set. Right? In, in maths, a multi-set is just a set except it allows duplicate items. Right? So each item has a count. Um, so we just pretty much implemented some operations of a multi-set. Okay, so now uh, let's look at how we might use a hash table to solve some problems, right? So not an ADT, but just some functions right, to solve relatively simple problems. Okay, so so turns out that a hash table um, can of, is often used as a set or a counter right, to solve problems efficiently because hash tables are 0, 01 on average. Right, for each of the main operations. So we have three problems that we're going to try and solve. So the first one is called two sum, which is a really you know, classic problem. Um, I think it was also one of the tutorial questions earlier in the term. Um, we also have odd occurring elements and anagram, right? So first of all, let's look at two sum. So the two sum problem is you're given an array, you're given a target value, Right? And you want to figure out if there are two elements in the array, two you know, distinct elements in the array at different indexes that sum up to target value. Okay, so here are some examples. So given this array, 12, 6, 3, 3, 7, 8. Uh, so if we call the function with a target value of 13, then the function should return true. Right, that's because 6 plus 7 equals 13. Okay, if we call the function with a target value of 16, then it should return false. Right? And you can, it returns false because you can check you know, all the possible pairs and none of them sum up to 16. Right? And 
eights. So there is an eight in the array, but you can't add the eight to itself, right? Because the eight only appears once. Okay, um, another example is if you're given the value three, right, then the function should return false as well, because even though there is a three in the array, um, it doesn't satisfy you know, the problem that, uh, the, the actual problem. So the problem is find two elements that sum up to S, right? There isn't any pair of elements in the array that sum up to three, so the answer is false. All right, and finally, if the target value is six, then the function should return true because three plus three equals six. Okay, so let's try and implement this using a hash table. Um, so let's go to, to sum. So to sum, let's see. Okay, and what we want to do here is take advantage of the efficiency of a hash table, right? So let's think about how we might implement this uh, without a hash table, right? And without any special data structures, right? So one way we could do it is to use a nested for loop, right? So I'm going to first implement it that way. So for int i equals zero, i less than size i plus plus. Right now for each element, we're going to check if there is another element that if we sum them together, add up to sum. Right, so that means we're going to iterate through every possible pair of elements. So the second loop, the inner loop, is going to start at i plus one. Right, that's because we don't want to end up adding an element to itself. So j equals i plus one, j is less than size, and j plus plus. Okay, and then we check if array i plus array j is equal to sum. Right, and if that's true, then we return true. And otherwise, we return false. Okay, so, so I'm going to just run the test on this. So here are just some tests. Test to sum. Right, so all the tests passed, which means that our function works. Uh, but if we run our benchmark program, which uses a much larger array, I'm not, uh, so this will take much longer. So hold on. time benchmark to sum. Okay, and hopefully it does finish soon. There are only 50,000 elements, so it should be relatively quick. So yeah, 11 seconds, right? So quite slow, right? And what is the time complexity of this solution? Do you wanna tell us? Yeah, so it's n squared, right? Because the function does use two nested loops and um, it's important to actually look at what the loops do in detail because even though there are two nested loops, that doesn't necessarily mean it's O n squared, right? But if you look at what these loops do, um, well, the first loop iterates from zero up to n, right? And the inner loop iterates depending on what value of i the program is up to, right? So if the value of i is zero, so the first iteration of the outer loop, the inner loop iterates n times or n minus one times to be more precise, right? When i is equal to one, the inner loop iterates n minus two times and so on. So what we have is a uh, arithmetic sum, right, which is one plus two plus three plus all the way up to n minus one. And that makes the function O n squared. Okay, so this function is pretty inefficient. Um, so let's think about how we can make it more efficient using a hash table, right? So, so first thing to notice, um, so in order to, you know, figure out how, how we might use a hash table, we can try and 
sort of reframe this solution, right, as being, well, first the outer loop loops through every element of the array, right? So I'm going to just create a variable here that stores that element, right? And what we're actually doing in the inner loop is we're trying to find an element in the array that is equal to some minus array i, right? That's what the inner loop is actually doing, right? And if there is an element in the array which is equal to some minus array i, then we return true, right? So that is what um, the inner loop is doing. Now, now we can try and make this operation more efficient, right? Finding an element, right? Because hash table does allow us to perform searches really efficiently. So let's try this approach, right? So what we'll do is we'll store every element in the array into a hash table, all right? And then for each element, we're gonna check if some minus array i exists. Okay, so let's uh, make some space here. So what we'll do is create a hash table uh, using hash table new. And then um, we're going to insert every element of the hash table into uh, every element of the array into the hash table. So, so for i equals zero, i less than size, i plus plus, hash table insert, ht um, array i. Right? And it doesn't matter what value we use because we're using the hash table as a set pretty much. Okay, and then for, now for every element, right, we're going to check if the hash table contains a size, sorry, not size, but sum minus array i. And if it does, then we return true, but not before freeing the hash table. All right, so we'll call hash table free. And if we've gone through all the elements and the complements, some minus array i doesn't exist, then we also free the hash table and return false. Okay, so let's try compiling this. Okay, so right, unused variable. Yeah, so I need to like comment out all this. Well, let's do it this way. So if zero and if okay, so. Now let's run the test program and you know maybe the program will work, maybe it doesn't, but yeah, since I implemented it, I know that it's not gonna work. So um, yeah, so the program failed this assertion. Uh, so let's have a look at which assertion it is. So it was this one, right? So we're calling the two sum function and giving it the target value 16. Um, and this test is failing, right? Which means that we expected the function to return false because of this exclamation mark, but the function returned true instead. So does anyone have any ideas what is wrong with our function? Sorry? Did you use an eight twice? Yeah, so the problem is that we're using the eight twice, right? So we're adding the eight to itself. And why is that happening? That's because at the beginning, we are actually adding all the elements to the hash table, right? So in our second loop, when we looped through all the elements and we looked for some minus array i, right? when i was up to this element, right? and we looked for some minus array i, we ended up finding the same elements, right? 
8 plus 8 equals 16. Um, so that is the problem with our program, our function. So does anyone have any ideas about how we can fix this? Yeah, so, yeah, cool. So let's, um, so for our new approach, let's actually, before we insert array i, we're going to check if some minus array i exists in the hash table. Right? And if it does, that means there you know, is a pair of elements that sum up to the target sum. And if there isn't, then we're just going to keep looking. Right, so here, let me just show you an example of what our approach is going to look like. All right, so suppose we're looking for the element, uh, we're looking for the target sum um, 10. Right, I think 10 is a good example. All right, so what we're going to do is when we look at our first element 12, we want to check if the element negative two exists in the hash table, right? So since we haven't inserted any elements yet, then that's always gonna be false, right? So we keep going, uh, but before we keep going, we actually insert 12 into the hash table, right? So the hash table now contains 12. Then we move on to the next element six, right? We check if four exists in the hash table. Right now, if it does, that means the four was in the array earlier, right? But in this case, it wasn't. Um, so what we just, what we do is we just insert six into the hash table. Right, next, the next element is three. Right now, when we look at three, we check if seven is in the hash table. Right now, seven doesn't exist in the hash table, so we just insert three into the hash table and keep going. Now, the next element is also three, so again, we check if seven, if seven exists and it doesn't, so we keep going. And when we see the seven, we check if three is in the hash table, and it is, right? So we can return true. All right, so by doing this, we're basically, for each element, we're checking if there is an element to the left of it, right, that when we add them together, sums up to the target value, right? Instead of checking if there is any element in the array that, you know, when sums with it, adds up to the target value. So this makes it more similar to our nested loop approach from earlier, right? Okay, so, oops. Okay, so let's modify our approach. Right, so we're gonna take these four lines right, and put them above the insert call. Right, so before we insert array i, we're going to check if sum minus array i is in the hash table. Right, and if this, then we return true. Otherwise, we insert array i into the hash table. Right, then we're going to delete all of these lines, and now this should work. Right, so we'll compile, then uh, run our tests, and now all the tests pass. All right. Cool, so that's two sum. So in this example, we use the hash table as a set. Cool, so does anyone have any questions about this problem? So, all right, if not, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll move on and look at the other problems.
Okay, we are back. So let's continue churning through these problems. Okay, so the first problem was two sum. Uh, the next problem is called odd occurring elements. Okay, so what we want to do is given an array of integers, we want to return the number of integers that occur an odd number of times. Right. So here are some examples. Right. So here we have an array where the four occurs three times, the eight occurs twice, and three occurs once. Right. So the four and the three occur an odd number of times, right? three times and one time. So this function should return two. Okay, in the next example, uh, we have just an array of distinct elements, right? So each of these elements occur once, which is an odd number of times, so the function should return six. Okay, and in the last example, we have three pairs of elements, so two ones, two threes, and two sevens. Each of the elements occur an even number of times, so we should return zero. Okay, so let's try and implement this. So odd occurring, odd occurring dot C. Okay, so does anyone have any ideas about how we could use a hash table in this situation? Um, set. As a set? Mm. And you can uh, go through, or oh, if you want to optimize it even more, you can uh, uh, like take note of every unique uh, value and then iterate through the unique values and check the count of those. And whichever one, every time there's a one that odd count, uh, implement the exact value. Yeah, so, yeah, so the idea is to use the hash table as a counter, right? So. Um, and that's because we do want to count how many of each element there are so that we can check how many of them occur an odd number of times. Right, so if we just use the hash table as a set, then we wouldn't really be able to do that, right? Keep track of the count. So let's use the counter, or use the hash table as a counter. So, whoops, why am I type a counter? Um, we, we don't have a counter here, so we, we just have a hash table. So hash table new, it's going to create a new hash table, right. and then let's go through the array, right, and for each element in the array, we're just going to increment the counts of the elements by one, right, so we're going to insert, or we're going to get the counts of the elements from the hash table, right, it doesn't exist in the hash table yet, then the count will be zero. And then we're going to reinsert the item with a count of, well, with the count increased by one. Okay, so, uh, recalling how we did this for the count ADT earlier, remember we used the hash table get or default function, right? In order for the function to return zero, if the item doesn't exist in the hash table yet. Right, so int count equals hash table gets or default hash table array i and we'll pass in a default value of zero. Right, so that's what the count is if the element doesn't exist. And then we're just going to reinsert the element with the count increased by one. Counts plus one. Right, and now our hash table should contain the counts of every element. Okay, so now let's figure out which elements have an odd count. Right, so to do that, we'll go through the array again. Right, and now we're going to check the count of each element using the get function. Right, we know that every element does exist in the hash table now, so we can just use the get function. So 
int count equals hash table get uh, hash table array i right and if the count is odd so if count mod 2 is equal to 1 then we're going to increment some variable right that is keeping track of how many so far we've how many elements so far we found that are odd so int odd or num odds so num odds plus plus right and then let's return num odds at the end right so anyone want to comment on this question Yeah. It would say that the first three, uh, when it goes to the first three, it would say mm -hmm. odd, odd doesn't then increment to another yeah. one. Yeah. Go to the second three and then do the same thing again. Yeah, you're spot on. So this uh, function is actually going to double count or triple count or you know quintuple count <laughs> elements that appear an odd number of times, right? So if we actually run this, uh, run our tests. Right, then it's actually going to fail on this one, right? Um, and that's because we are counting the four three times, right? Because we're looping through every element of the array and we're saying, does this occur an odd number of times? Uh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So our function is actually going to end up returning four instead of two, right? But we want to, what we want to do is count how many distinct elements occur an odd number of times. Right, so let's go back to uh, code. Yeah, so that's a good idea. Right, so in order to avoid double counting, um, let's, after we've checked whether an item occurs an odd number of times, let's remove it from the hash table, right, so that we don't count it again. So over here, so after we've checked, uh, after we've retrieved the counts and checked it, we'll just call hash table delete. Hash table delete array i. Right, and now our function should work as expected. Um, whoops, okay. <laughs> I see what the problem is. Um, so, so what was the problem? Um, uh, yeah, so the problem is we're removing items from the hash table. Um, but then later on, if that item exists in the array again, then when we call the hash table get function, it's going to give us an error because the item doesn't exist anymore. So let's change the get function to get or default and make it return zero if the item doesn't exist. Right. Let's compile and run it again. Right, and now the tests pass. Okay, yeah. Could we also, uh, like if we go back to the code, yep. um, could we, instead of delete hash table, mm -hmm. um, could we just like instead it, but like have um, the value of zero as well? Like if, so the, so if you have like three, three, yeah. The value would just go back to zero instead of three. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, that is another approach we could take. So instead of deleting, we could set its count to zero. Uh, yeah, set its value to zero. So hash table insert ht array i zero. And if we do this, then we can still continue using the get function instead of get or default. Because the key will still exist in the hash table. Oops. Um, is there any efficiency? Um, so, is there any difference in efficiency right between the two methods? Um, like hmm. or default and delete, or just using hash table get and then insert here. Yeah. So that is an interesting problem. So. Hmm. So my first 
instinct tells me that deleting could be more efficient because you're reducing the number of elements in the hash table. Um, and therefore, when you call get or default later on, um, it might not need to compare with as many elements as before. Um, so hmm. Sorry? I imagine that would be quite possible, right? Um, yeah, because, because like the hash table does resize as you insert more elements. Um, so searching and inserting is still going to be 01 on average. Yeah. So maybe there isn't going to be as big of a difference between the two methods. Um, but actually, this is an um, interesting um, problem for benchmarking, right? You could create a large array and then see how long it takes you know, for the two different methods. OK, so if we compile and run it, then the tests pass. OK, cool. So that is odd occurring elements. So any questions about that? Oh, OK, so next problem is anagram. All right, so in this problem, we are given two strings, and we want to figure out if they are anagrams. OK, so what is an anagram? Well, two strings are anagrams if they contain the same amount of each character. OK, so here are some examples. So A, B, C, D, E, and E, D, C, B, A are anagrams because they contain one each of A, B, C, D, and E. A, B, C, D, E, and F, D, C, B, A are not anagrams, right? Because uh, the first string has an A, the second string has an F, right? Oh, actually, hold on a second. No, the first string has an E, right? Which the second string doesn't have, and the second string has an F, which the first string doesn't have. All right, third example, um, A, B, C, D, E, and A, B, C, D, E, F, right? Now, these are not anagrams because the second string has an F and the first string doesn't have an F. Okay, A, 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 B, B, and A, B, A, B, A, these are anagrams because each string has three A's and two B's. Right? And for the last example, A, 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 B, B, and B, A, B, A, B, those are not anagrams because the first string has three A's and two B's, but the second string has two A's and three B's. So let's try and solve this using a hash table. So anagram.seq. OK, so any ideas about how we might use a hash table for this problem? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we can use a hash table as a counter to count the number of occurrences of each character. Um, and in this case, since we have two strings, what are we going to do? Two? Yeah, two hash tables, yeah. So we can use two hash tables, right? uh, one for each string. Okay, so let's create two hash tables, so hash table um, ht, well, let's call it s, I don't know, s counts, I don't know what name to give it, s counts equals, or let's call it s counter, equals hash table new, hash table t counter, equals hash table new. Okay, and now we're just going to uh, go through all the characters in each string and add them to the corresponding hash table. Right, so let's loop through the first string. So to loop through a string, remember each string 
is terminated with a null character. So we're going to keep looping while we don't see a null terminator. Right, so in i equals zero, uh, s i is not equal to null character i plus plus. Right, we'll add one to the count of the current character. Right, so what's going to look like? Uh, well, the count is going to be to get the current count. Uh, we'll call hash table get for default. S counter um, s of i n zero. Right, and then we're going to reinsert the character into the hash table with the count increased by one. Oops, s i count plus one. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing for the second hash table. Sorry, second string. So t i is not equal to null. Now, since we are repeating the same piece of code, um, this would be better put in a helper function, right? So let's actually do that. Okay, so whenever you know you're repeating the same thing twice, you should you know your spidey sensor should be tingling and you should be thinking, okay, I should write a new function. All right, so int, um, well, not int, but what we'll make this function do is take in a string and return a hash table containing the count of each character. All right, so string to hash table, char star s. All right, and we're just going to take these lines and put them in this function. Right, and we'll also add a line here to create a hash table. So hash table ht equals hash table new. Right, and I'm going to have to change the names of these. So ht and ht and return ht at the end. Okay, so let's take this function prototype and put it at the top. Okay, and now we can just call that function twice. Okay, so string to hash table s and string to hash table t. Okay, so now we have the counts of the characters in S and T. So now let's check that the counts of the characters are the same. Right, so in order to do this, um, it would be nice if we had you know, some kind of cursor in order to be able to iterate through the characters and their counts in the hash table. But since this is C, uh, we are pretty limited in what we can do. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just loop through the characters of S, right? And then check the count of each of those characters. So in i equals zero, S of i is not equal to the null terminator, in i plus plus. Right, let's get the count of the characters of the character S i. So uh, S, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that is one thing that you want to check. Because and otherwise it could be the case that uh, all, the, uh, sorry, all the letters that appear in S, uh, mm -hmm. that, that those letters have the same number of occurrences in T, uh, yeah. but the T has extra letters that don't appear in S. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the problem is that um, the characters in S, right, if all of those characters appear the same amount of times in T, but T has some extra characters, then you know the current method would give us the wrong result, right? Because we're only looping through the characters in S. Um, so let me show you that actually. So, so first, let's get the 
let's get the count of the character in S. So S count equals hash table get S counter S of I. Right, then let's get the count of the character in the second hash table. Right, and this time we have to use get for defaults because we don't know whether the character is actually in the second string or not. So we'll call hash table get a default, pass it the second hash table and s sub i, and pass it the default value of zero. Right now, if s i, so if the count in the first string is the is not the same as the count in the second string, then we return false. Right, and now if we've gone through every character and the counts are the same, then we return true. All right, now we need to free our hash tables. I might have forgotten this actually in the previous problem. Okay, but now if we compile it and we run our test program, right, it's not going to pass all the tests, and that's because of the problem of the second string containing extra characters Right, so this test fails, right, because we went through each character in S, right, and each of those characters occurred the same number of times in T, but the problem is that T has some extra characters that are not in S. All right, so in order to fix this problem, um, one way to do it is to compare the string lengths before we actually do anything else. So if the strings are not the same length, then we return false, okay? And now, now if we get to this point in the function, then that means the strings have the same lengths, right? Which means if the strings are anagrams of each other, then you know, they have the same characters and they have the same counts, right? And it's not possible for the second string to have extra characters that are not in S, right? Because if it did, then that means the count of some of the characters in S won't be the same in T, right? So let's compile this program and run it. And now we pass all the tests, okay? So cool. Any questions about this problem? Okay, so... Right, so that's all the problems that I had. And I just wanted to show you quickly. Um, now, this isn't going to be accessible, but I just wanted to show you another example of hash table, which is Python dictionaries, right? So in Python, um, hash tables are provided as part of the language, right, and they're called dictionaries, right? So here are how we here is how we would create dictionaries in Python, right? So in order to create a dictionary, we use a pair of curly braces, right? And that's it. So it's actually built into the syntax, which is nice. Um, to insert a key value pair, we do something similar to indexing into an array, right? In C, right? So what we're doing is we're indexing into the dictionary using the key, right? And then we're setting that to the value, right? To check if a key exists, we use the in keyword, which is very nice. Um, to get the value associated with the key, we use, again, the pair of square brackets, right? And to delete a key value pair, we use the del keyword, right? So let's just go through a quick example, right? So here is Python, right? Now Python is a very different programming language with very different syntax, right? But let's just create a dictionary containing some favorite colors, right? So colors, so this creates a dictionary, right? Notice that, you know, we don't need a main function or anything. Um, in Python, we just type 
statements, and then they just run. Right, okay. Of course, we could create functions if we wanted. Right, so colors. Now, let's insert some of people's favorite colors into the hash table. Right, so let's suppose that you know, Jas likes the color green. Right, so this is how we would do it. Right, so now if we try to get just a certain color, we get green, right? Let's suppose Hayden's favorite color is red, right? So this is how we insert that. And let's suppose um, Sasha's favorite color is purple, right? So we insert that. Okay, so in the slide, I said that to check if a key exists, we use the in keyword, right? So let's check if jazz is in our dictionary, right? So jazz is in colors. So since jazz is in the dictionary, this should give us back true, right? So it should return true, right? And let's check someone who is not in the hash table. So let's go with Jake. Okay, so Jake is not in the dictionary, so this should return false, right? And what else do we, what else can we do? So let's change Jas's favorite color, right? Suppose Jas no longer likes the color green and he likes the color orange now, right? So we can replace his favorite color with orange, right? And now when we retrieve his favorite color, we get orange, right? And now let's try deleting someone from the hash table. So let's suppose we remove Hayden from the dictionary. Right, and now when we try to get, when we try to check if Hayden is in the dictionary, we get false, right? And when we, when we try to access um, the value associated with the key using this bracket syntax, we actually get an error if the key doesn't exist, right? Similar to how our hash table worked in C, right? So if I try to access Hayden now um, in our dictionary, we get an error, right? Which says that key error, so Hayden doesn't exist. Okay, and let's see, what else can we do? So Python actually has something similar to our get or default um, that we had in C. So, so the get or default in Python is the get function. All right. So, in Python, you know, different you know, data types or classes have functions called methods associated with them. So we can call the method by using the dot notation. So colors dot get. And if we pass in Hayden now, the get function allows us to specify a default value to return if the key doesn't exist, right? So my default value is gonna be no favorite color, right? And if I call this now, it's gonna return no favorite color, right? But if I call this on someone who is in the hash table, then it should return their favorite color. Right, so Sasha, this returns purple because Sasha is in the hash table. Right, so very nice. And you know, once you start learning high level languages like Python, you know, C++, you appreciate um, how much more functionality, how much more libraries are provided right, in these programming languages so that you can actually program things faster. Right? In C, we had to implement the hash table ourselves. Right. Whereas in Python and C++, these you know, data types containers are provided out of the box, right, which is very nice. Okay, so that is going to be it for our lecture. Um, so we don't have much left to cover, um, only two more lectures worth of content. And then week 10 is pretty much free. Um, I think it's just going to be 
for revision and talking about the exam. Okay, so yeah, we'll just end call it nice and early today. I'll see you guys on uh, Tuesday next week. And remember that there is a consult right after this. Um, so if any of you are confused about anything going on in the lectures, you want some help revising, then you can come over and see me. Okay, but yeah, enjoy the rest of your week.